Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Jeff Houston. Um, I don't work for RIPE, they're Europeans. Um, <laughs> I actually work for the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre. Uh, I'm their chief scientist. Um, I don't know what that means, actually. I just get to look at things that are interesting. You know, the real problem is that someone asked me to do this talk back in, I don't know, I've forgotten, May or something, right? And in May, it was kind of, oh, yeah, V6 talk. What didn't happen yesterday? The key role. We were meant to, yesterday at some time, 4 p.m. UTC or something, change the trust anchor of DNSSEC. Now, if there's one country in the world where almost everyone uses DNSSEC, you're sitting in it. And the role of the key is really important for each and every one of you. Because if we get this wrong, you guys, you guys, not even, don't worry about anyone else, here in this country won't have the DNS until we fix it. Oops. Now, this is quite fascinating because it was only a couple of weeks ago when the first results from a rather strange test came in that pointed to the fact that there are a bunch of people who weren't ready. I don't think we saw any Swedish resolvers. Few. Uh, but there were certainly other ones. And the story behind the postponement is certainly an interesting story. And if you've got questions about it, Let's do it at the end of this session, because I'll go through this talk anyway, because I think it's kind of fun. But the stuff about the key role is equally interesting, because this is a technical group. We're not talking politics here, we're not talking industry, we're talking tech. And the technology of how you instrument the DNS is fascinating. Because if there's one piece of technology which is completely opaque, we don't know how it works. When you're an authoritative name server, questions come at you. When you're a user, you just fire off questions into some DNS black hole and sometime answers come back. The how and why is fascinating. But like I said, um, <laughs> if I was doing slides last night, that's what I'd talk about today, but I'm not. We're talking about V6. Oddly enough, the two intersect. So it's not completely wasted. Um, I was at a meeting in APNIC, actually, in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago, and some guy from a well-known vendor that starts with a C was busy saying, we're running an all V6 network. And it was kind of, well, you know, maybe it's about time that someone actually said we're doing all V6. Because, you know, we've been working on V6 forever. The first initial meetings, in fact, the first idea that we we're running out of V4 addresses was almost 30 years ago, 1989. Frank Zielinski got in front of the IETF. Actually, I think at the time, the IETF was smaller than this room, just you sent a bit. Uh, got in front of the 20 people at the IETF at the time and said, oops, we've got a problem. And we started working on how we're going to solve it. Um, and it took some time. Uh, by about 1995, we had most of the spec done. And then we started doing testing and transition. And you know, this, is, this has been going on for almost 30 odd years. So has anyone not heard about it? Right, you know, you have to be dead not to hear about this one. So, you know, we've been working on it for three decades and, and you all know this. So talking about an all IPv6 network makes sense, right? Well, I wish you guys would follow plans. I really wish that when we set up a plan, you follow it. Because that was the plan, right? That was the plan. The plan was we'd never have to give away the last V4 address. The plan was, the plan was that you guys were going to prepare for this and that long before we had exhaustion staring at us, we were going to actually deploy V6 right up across the entire internet. Yep, that was the plan. So the way the plan was meant to work was that the early pioneers were meant to sort of deploy their V6-only networks at the edge, and they were going to tunnel across the middle of the network. Does anyone remember 6 to 4? Does anyone remember how shitty it was? 20% failure rate. You really had to hate your customers to deploy it. Does anyone remember Microsoft's Teredo? 35% failure rate. You despised your customers. I'm like, this was just rubbish. That idea was probably rubbish. Why? 
Tunneling is really bad in IP. Tunneling is difficult. It's bad enough when you're running a VPN and you control both ends. When you don't control either end and it's auto rendezvous, it's a recipe for complete disaster, which that was. Okay, we, we moved on. We started doing some sort of dual stack deployment, and this is kind of the middle of the transition. The idea is that the kind of isolated network starts supporting v4 and v6, and theoretically the v6 packets can make their way across those bits of the internet that support it without incident. Yeah, okay. And at the end, so far, you get these all v6 networks, and the v4 networks retreat to the edge, and they have to tunnel their way across the v6 internet. That was the theory. Now, you know, like I said, you're pretty crap at following plans, aren't you? <laughs> you're hopeless. Um, we, we kind of waltzed into 2011. IANA gave out its last slash eight block. APNIC ran out, ran out in uh, April of 2011. The RIPE NCC ran out in September 2012. You know, we've run out. We've run out. But you don't get it, do you? There's no V6. Only about 15 to 20 percent of the world uses V6, yeah? Everyone else doesn't. Most new deployments, most new deployments, use a smattering of V6 and a whole lot of NAT. A whole lot of NAT. And, and the legacy networks are only being gradually migrated. Um, here's the map of V6. Uh, the brighter the colour, the better you're doing. India. US. I am constantly avoiding naming Sweden because you're just not there. You know, <laughs> somewhere deep in the sort of the orangey ready bits is, is sort of where Sweden is. Um, so some countries have done it. Bizarre about India. Belgium has done it. Germany. But others that you'd think would kind of be there aren't. Most populous country, China. Not a glimmer. Whereas India, oh yeah. Uh, the world sort of deployment rate, 15%-ish. For someone that's run out of v4 addresses, this seems really, really weird. So how many devices are connected to the v4 internet? Well, someone estimated with all these insecure thingies that Marco was talking about, 30 billion. Out of 1.8 billion used addresses, 30 billion devices are connected. So we may not be very good at six, but by God, we're really good at NATs. And there's probably a reason for that. And there's probably a reason for the V4 being the universal glue of the internet. It works. And it generates revenue. And there's not a single person here who would spend extra money without generating extra income. And so V6 becomes, in your deployed networks, a kind of, why should I upgrade the users? Why should I put them through this kind of hell just to give them the same service they had yesterday? Which is kind of the problem, isn't it? that economically this is a market failure. So there we are, right there in the middle of the system. Dual stack networks, quite frankly, they will try and use V6 when it's around. Um, when it's not, they won't, which means the more you deploy V6, the more we will see it being used. But that's bullshit. And the reason why is actually a really tricky thing about the way your systems work when they're connected to both protocols. You use happy eyeballs. Now, happy eyeballs is a shorthand way of saying, when I am dual stack and you're the server and you're dual stacked, what I'm going to do is to try starting a connection in both protocols at once. So I'll start doing a DNS request for your IPv4 address. And if I get an answer, I'll try to open a TCP connection. At the same time, because I'm a computer and I can do two things at once, I'm not a man, um, <laughs> I go and do the request for the quad A record, the V6 record, and I try and open up a TCP connection. Now, in a pure happy eyeball situation, whichever opens first, you just take, and the other one you stop. So if V4 is faster, you'll go with V4. If V6 is faster, you'll go with V6. But we're never going to get anywhere with this, this transition until you bias that. So what actually goes on is that the V6 connection gets a one-third of a second advantage, 300 milliseconds. So as long as V6 is no worse than 300 milliseconds slower, you'll choose V6. 
How far does a packet go in 300 milliseconds around the world? So it's a pretty generous kind of thing. And most of the time, V6 will sort of work if you have a dual stack. But as the fine, the fine print says, we're intolerant of that these days. And the latest thing from Apple says, you're only going to get 50 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds. That's now getting to be pretty tight. So for those of you who have deployed V6, do you route down the same paths as V4? Is if two things are connected in 4 and 6, are the paths between the two in 4 and 6 the same? Because if they're different, you're going to change the way this works. India is a classic. Their V4 routes across the Bay of Bengal, directly to Singapore. In V6, they route via the United Kingdom. Because you can. Does happy eyeballs work? No, it's atrocious. All this V6 deployment, and in that part of the world, they only use V4. So there's a number of subtleties about V6 and this kind of approach that it takes a lot of learning to actually understand what's going wrong and why. Happy eyeballs, you better route your V4 and V6 down the same paths or things are going to work badly. So as far as I can see, things aren't quite right yet. And that question, that question, when do you drop V4? When do you go to V6? Are we ready yet? Is really a very, very timely question except if you're in Sweden and you're asleep. Because with others, they've made the investment, but they're still trying to support four. When can you turn it off? When can you go to the economics of a single stack internet? So the issue is, is it wise or are you being brave or are you being silly? To what extent is V6 reliable and ready for use? That's a really good question. Because literally, we cannot run V4 forever. We can see the end. I'm like cramming 30 billion devices into 1.8 1, 1 billion addresses is, is truly a miracle, truly. But I don't think you're going to cram 300 billion. You can't keep on upping the number and hoping that V4 will cope. Something's going to break. So at some point, you are going to have to look at, does a V6-only network actually work? And that's a really interesting question. What do we have in V4 that we don't have in 6? What do we need? What are we relying on today that V6 doesn't provide? So if it's nothing, feel free. Turn on V6, you're done. But otherwise, maybe we've got some work to do. So let's go back and roll all the way back to, I was told it was the Big Ten meeting in Chicago in 1993, when there was a bunch of folk arguing over what should go in an IP header. And there you see the two IP headers actually out there. And there are some subtle differences. Certainly there are bigger addresses in V6, but there are fewer other fields. Where's the identification frags and frag offset? It's gone. What's this flow label? Well, it's new. There's a bunch of sort of subtle changes there. Type of service got changed into traffic class. No one uses QoS, no one uses traffic class, cosmetic change, didn't matter. Anyone who sets those bits is basically an optimist, an insane optimist. It will make no difference. Uh, the flow label was added, mainly because Bob Hinden was working for a company that wanted to use it at the time. That company's now broke. The flow label is largely cosmetic. Set whatever you like and it makes no difference. Um, <laughs> the options and protocol fields were replaced by extension headers. So this is a bit interesting. This is the variable part of the header. You never used it in V4. As long as you never use it in V6, you'll be fine. As long as you never use it in V6. Because you don't use them in V4, because routers drop them. Oh, fragmentation was pushed into an extension header. That was kind of a big oops on the floor moment. Because the one thing, the one thing, and I'm going back to about 1985, that made IP so much better than DECnet, that made IP actually better than Apple Talk, or any other protocol we knew at the time, the one thing was fragmentation. Because before that, you had to understand what packet sizes were in order to get packets through a network. 
How big could you send a packet through an X25 network? 128 bytes. What about ATM? Well, 53. Oh my God. What about Ethernet? Well, anything between uh, 64 and 1500. What about FIDI? Well, that was 4000. What would happen if you tried to send a FIDI packet, 4000 octets, into an Ethernet, 1500 octets? If you're using IP, you could fragment. You could make it work. Any other protocol, you could not. So fragmentation was brilliant. That's why we're running IP. Yet now, we've pushed the fragmentation control into the never-never land of optional extension headers. Oh, and the checksum becomes a media layer. Don't really care about the others. Care like crazy about those two. Because if you're going to run V6, you've got to worry like hell about those two. And most people don't. So that's the substantive change. That was the outcome of that meeting in Chicago. That was what happened to change V6. And it's a really subtle change. But as I said before, fragmentation was the heart of why people ran IP and not DECnet. Actually, DECnet was a pretty crap protocol, but by the by. <laughs> that was at the heart of all this. So what really changed? In V4, you just send a packet on its way. If the next hop was X25 or something that had a really small packet size, you took the big packet, shredded it and sent it on its way. So the packet movement was always forward. The destination address is all you needed. You ever seen those networking diagrams of the 3GPP protocol where you've got boxes and larrows and stuff everywhere? This is what this looks like in V6. Because routers are not allowed to fragment packets. Not allowed by the standard. So the middle of the network has to drop the packet. You can't send it on and fragment it. You have to send a message back to the source saying, that was too big, you should try something smaller. And the source has meant to fragment the packet and send the little bits onward. Sound reasonable? Everyone, sounds reasonable? Nod, yes. Who runs MPLS? Oh, come on, you all do. Is MPLS bidirectional? Shit, no. It's only one way. What happens if that's in the middle of an MPLS tunnel? You meant to say, uh, um, I don't know either. Because I don't know. You can only push it forward. All of a sudden, the assumptions that we make about IP start to fall over when you introduce that kind of behavior. Because in MPLS, yes, that ICMP message has to go the other direction. God knows what happens after that. I've never figured it out. From the stats we're about to see, you haven't either. Oops. But no one ever fragments, do they? It's not really that important. We'll get on to that. So, OK, this is a problem. The middle has to talk backwards, and sometimes the middle doesn't like doing that. And secondly, you can't drop ICMP. How many of you run firewalls that drop ICMP? Hands up, everyone. ICMP is evil. You can't authenticate. Drop like crazy. But, but I needed it, <laughs> because I can't use a smaller packet until I get that ICMP telling me the last one was too big. So dropping it's a disaster. Oops. So now we're into this strange situation that routers can't frag. Only the sending host can frag. That's a problem. And you need that ICMP6 packet. That's a problem. What happens when you get it? Now, this is the bit in V6 where weird magic takes over. Because at the top of the packet, uh, is there a laser pointer here? I'm hoping. I can just point. Um, there's a TCP header. The original TCP header is sent back to the source. So what the source is meant to do is to delve into this mush of bits and somehow find the original TCP header. So far, so good. And then it's going to look at all of its active sockets. If it finds a match, it's going to adjust the MSS size and interpret this as a new form of TCP, a NAC, not acknowledge and resend the packet, if you're lucky. And if you're running UDP, oh shit, we don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. 
And when I say we have no idea, think of what the DNS runs over. And if the answer is UDP and we have no idea, that's sort of where you put these two together. Oops. So it's sort of, oh God, I meant to put it into the forward in case and revise the MSS and somehow hope that the DNS or something else tries to make the packet go again. Because in UDP, when I send a packet, that's it. The packet's gone. I can't resend it because this is not an acknowledged protocol. So this is now weird. I've got a signaling mechanism that doesn't match transport. <sighs> oh, to go back to Chicago and the Big Ten meeting going, no, don't do this. This is seriously broken. But that's not all that's seriously broken. Who runs DNS servers on Anycast right now, here today, in this room? Inet, put your, iRoot, put your hand up. Because you are absolutely hosed. Because think about any cast for a second. There's a whole bunch of devices all on the same address. The forward path from the client to the server is OK. But the backward path, yes, MPLS notwithstanding, the path back is a different path. You go through different routers. When they generate an ICMP message, will they go to the same Anycast instance? Well, um, uh, um, mostly, except when they don't. And I can't tell and you can't tell, but if you think that all the iRoot servers respond to ICMP, the last thing you sent me was too big, you're dreaming. Because there are instances of that where, quite frankly, the whole thing just breaks in any cast. We can't make any cast work reliably in V6 with big packets. <sighs> We're all sighing now, this is getting a bit lousy. You know, what can we do about this? I want to advance this slide. Does someone know the right button? I'm sort of like an ICMP stall. This is what happens when it all goes badly. Sorry? Yeah, right, power off, reset. <laughs> Let me try the other button. Who's in control up the back there? I need this slide advanced. Manual control. Okay, the next problem, really, really high speed data. How do you do 100 gig? Anyone know? It's 4 by 25. So you actually don't do 100 gig, you do a bunch of parallel paths at a lower speed. Some people do 100 gig as 10 times 10 gig. But there's a real trick with doing that. You don't just splay the bits, you push the packets down different paths. The one thing you should never ever do to TCP is get the packets out of order. Because you can take a 100 gig pipe and get only megs of throughput if you do. So it is essential that you understand which flow should go down which pipe. And you've only got a few nanoseconds to find out because you're running a really, really fast piece of silicon. So let's just understand what happens when you insert an extension fragmentation header between IP and transport. What's the offset of the transport header? Well, uh, um, it used to be 44 octets forward, but now I don't know because there's this variable gunk in the way and I've got to do multiple memory cycles. But I've only got nanoseconds to look it up. Shit, better drop the packet. And so what you actually find <laughs> is that any kind of space where you have transport awareness in your network, load balances are a big one. You actually find that extension headers cause the packet to be dropped, not passed on, because you don't know where to look quickly. If you've got heaps of CPU time, fine, go and look. But if you don't, you've got no choice. You just drop it. So a lot of transport sensitive stuff, when they come to V6 and they find those extension headers, Drop the packet. Right. We're into manual control. OK, so someone looked at this a few years ago, Fernando Gont, Jen Lankova, and Andrew Sullivan, and found that there was a drop rate of around 30 to 40% when you sent big packets towards servers. Who sends a big packet to a server? Nobody. That's the get requests. They're the tiny bits. What you're really worried about is when you send a large packet back to a client. So the real question here is, what is the drop rate when you send the packet back? 
long suspense because this is the kind of, you know, <laughs> we want to revert, we want to go forward by one. I'm sorry about this. Well, maybe they are. So what I do, good, is I do measurement via online ads. It's taken away my controller. Um, ads are brilliant. More people should look at more ads. It's fantastic. Because an ad is not just a picture. An ad is an active piece of JavaScript. And if you get it right, the JavaScript will run whether or not you click. And if you don't click on it, I don't pay. So I can do millions of these things a day for a tiny fraction of price and measure large amounts of the internet every single day. Now what can I do in an ad? I do what you always do. I get URLs. Give me this URL. What does that make you do? You've got to look up the DNS and you've got to do a web fetch. So I make sure that the DNS name is absolutely unique. So no caching. And I make sure with the web, there's nothing that's sort of um, cacheable in this. It's all HTTPS. Again, no caching. Oh, OK. There's something wrong with the laser pointer. Don't even try and click it. So what I do is I do a gratuitous fragmenter. And that instead of just getting a DNS answer, every single time the ad went somewhere, the answer got fragmented. And every single time you tried to drag a web object, Oops, the answer got fragmented. I have not got the laser on. Oh, there we go. Now, with a few tricks in the DNS, and if you've ever heard about glueless um, delegation, that's the trick I'm using, the DNS can tell you what the DNS is doing. And so if you want to know, did you get that fragmented answer? The DNS itself will say, yes, I got it. I'll continue with resolution. And equally, if I muck around in TCP, I look at the ACK packets coming back. If I send you a bunch of fragmented goo and you whack it, we're good. So that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. Now, we did these experiments across, I think it was about one and a half weeks, 40 million endpoints all over the globe. If you used a V6 capable resolver and half the planet do, so that's a lot of people, 38%, 37% of you can't get a big packet in, in the DNS including if you use Google. Whoops. Whoops. More than a third can't get big packets in the DNS. 20% uh, of end users can't get fragmented v6. That's terrible. Um, there's a reason why that's terrible and a reason why you don't care. So let's go into why you don't care. Why don't people fix it? Why isn't Google fixing this? Because if you set up a v6-only DNS server and you make sure you're running DNSSEC and you send back big answers, Google will not hear you. They will not get the answer. And the answer is because v4 fixes everything. Remember that thing about happy eyeballs? If six doesn't work, turn to four. Well, you know, that's true. And you're not going to fix something that's not obviously broken in the user's eyes. So v6 just makes it all better. So there's no imperative for you to go and fix it. The problem's been there with Google for over two years, and no one's even bothered fixing it, because v4 makes it all better. So there's no practical incentive. You never spend money to fix a problem that users aren't complaining about. You don't fix it. So what happens when you've got no more v4? All of a sudden, it's going to be too late, because you have to fix a problem you weren't counting on with no time left to do it. Oops. So we have to avoid fragmentation. TCP, don't use large MSSs. Don't use large segment sizes. Knock them down a bit. 1,500 is a bad number. Google were running at 1,280. They've upped it to 1,350. That's probably a good number. So TCP can work. UDP can work as long as you don't try and send big packets. Now. The thing about UDP and DNS and big packets is DNSSEC. During this key roll that didn't quite happen, if you now search for the DNS keys of the root zone, the answer will be 1,414 octets. 
which for V6 is skimming really close to a problem and indeed has about a problem for about 5% of you. So if we actually want this to work reliably, stop doing this backwards, we've got to do something about, TC, sorry, about UDP and V6 because this can't work. So one answer is we go back and redo that meeting in Chicago and go, well, that was wrong. Let's do forward fragmentation. Let's go and change all the V6 to behave differently. Anyone think that's a serious suggestion? Because <laughs> I'd like to talk to you, because I'd like to understand how we can make that kind of change this late in the day. This stuff is now deep down in the ASICs in firmware. We're no longer agile. We are deeply cemented into the way it currently works. So quite frankly, do I change the way our routers and switches work in V6 to actually alter this behavior? Pigs will fly first. OK, that's a problem. What about another solution? Um, change it the other way. Get all the deployed routers and switches to actually alter the way we manage packet fragmentation. Don't do ICMP, do something else. You know, Again, it's just not going to work that way. And so we're really running out of options very, very quickly. And the issue is, at some point, we've got to give up on fragmentation and V6 completely. What makes the DNS work? It's cheap. You don't pay for it. Why is it so cheap? Because it uses UDP. Because if we had to use TCP, the servers would be at least 10 times larger because of TCP session state. We'd probably also have to change the protocol a lot. So UDP is fast and cheap and doesn't quite work properly in V6. Damn. Which means we're kind of staring at that last option. We have to move it off UDP. That's easily said, but anyone who runs a large-scale DNS server, do you run one in .se? Is sort of sitting there looking at their memory and compute capacity going, I can't do it all in TCP. I have to spend a massive amount of, of additional money. But what else are you going to do? Are you going to change V6? <laughs> are you going to change the way it handles fragmentation? No. Are you going to change the way your load balances and switches work? Well, in the fullness of time, in a few decades from now. In the immediate, no. So you're between a rock and a hard place. You've either got to change the deployed V6 network and change the way it handles fragmentation. You've got to actually manage this properly, which you're never going to do. Or you're going to point at the DNS and go, you change. I haven't got a problem. You have a problem. And it seems that that's precisely where we're heading that we're going to point at the DNS and go, well, the DNS actually has to do the change. So that's going to cost. It's going to cost in effort. It's going to cost in money. It's going to cost in people. And it's cost that you're not going to spend until the last second. So collectively, we're sitting there working on V4, just kind of hoping the Nats will keep on working. And by the time we really need to rely on V6, oops. We've got a huge problem. So at this particular point, it seems that the DNS really, really has to change. So does this slide. But of course, the real reaction from everyone, and I don't think you're any different, is that if you close your eyes and just sleep, when you wake up, it'll all be better. Or maybe not. Thank you. OK, we have time uh, straight away. Question straight away in the front here. I'll turn off mine, if I can figure out how. There we go. Oh, OK, Mike Labramson again. I remember I, I saw part of this talk uh, that you did somewhere else. So I can't believe you did this talk without mentioning the DF flag in MPV4. Uh, I mean, most of the traffic on V4 has the DF flag set, so it's not going to fragment. You're going to do path M2 discovery. So the problem is prevalent in V4. Most of the TCP traffic has DF set, none of the UDP, right? and that's the real distinction. TCP, you can kind of work around, and the reason why is a whole bunch of issues around the way TCP works, that it's a continuous conversation between the sender and the receiver, and when something goes balked in the middle, even the loss of signal 
is a good indication that there's something to fix. So for some reason, and I think it was largely based on a paper written in 1988, largely based on really bad data done by Jeffrey Mogul, that fragmentation was considered harmful. Yes, it was when you're running a VAX or, or a PDP-10. Fragmentation was ugly. But other than that, nonsense paper that we shouldn't fragment. And the reason why folks set the DF bit is that they feel better about it. God knows why. But in TCP, harmless. In the DNS, in UDP, setting the don't fragment flag in four is like shooting your foot off. It's very painful and all you do after that is limp. So people don't set it because it's, it basically destroys the service. In V6, we cemented the DF flag to on. Only the source can fragment. And then we made it really impossible for the source to get back the information going, I need to fragment this again because of UDP. UDP is hard. And so what we're doing is actually pushing the fragmentation problem up to the application layer. Now the DNS can survive if it does UDP, EDNS zero, buffer size searching. If you're a DNS weenie, that sentence made sense. To everyone else, I apologize. Um, <laughs> if you do that, you can find out what's going on and, and correct the problem. Other than that, you kind of go, no answer. Well, that was a problem. Maybe the server's dead. So yeah, it, it, DF won't fix your problem here. No, I didn't say it did. But we are carrying a lot of V4 with DF flag set. In uh, TCP. So your opinion there on MPLS and the forward path and so on, that's being done widely. Um, uh, there's not a lot of it. Because in TCP, you're really not pushing hard. Why? Tunneling is relatively rare in V4. And tunneling is the bit that gives us all nightmares. Well, you, you have a lot of PPPoE where the MT was uh, 1492. Uh, I, I would say like half of the planet sits behind PPPoE, probably something like that. That is 1492 in. Uh, but yes, they do MSS adjust to work around that problem. Yes, right. We're, MSS adjust is done as well. Yes. Right. So let me tell you about one more protocol, just to give you a nightmare. Chrome now has around 78% market share. You've got Chrome running on on your mobile. You've got Chrome running everywhere. Chrome is actually configured with a new protocol called Quick. And if the server says I can do Quick, Chrome will switch and use Quick. Quick is a really nice protocol. If you're all worried about people peering over your shoulder, Quick is encrypted. If you're even behind a NAT, Quick understands that. And I think it uses a 64-bit session ID that sort of I don't care about source addresses or anything like that. If the session ID works, it's cool. Quick is fast. Quick has a very nice user implementation of flow control. It's not TCP, though. Quick is UDP. And because it's UDP, all that fancy V6 ICMP, find the TCP session, do magic, no magic here, the operating system won't help you. So with Quick, you can't fragment. You just can't if you want it to be reliable. So with Quick, what they're saying is it's 1350 octets. If you can't support yeah, 1350 yeah, through the net, Jeff, you've got a Jeff, problem. This brings to my third point. Oh, good. Packet layer MTU discovery. That's what Quick does. It doesn't sit just on 1350. It actually does packet layer MTU discovery. That was in the talk at the last IETF. I, uh, I was there listening to that talk. I really find it very amazing that we're shaving milliseconds out of TCP. I'll shave happy eyeballs down from 300 milliseconds to 50. I'll yeah, shave uh, two milliseconds if I do this and that. And at the same time, I still get these Luddites talking about the fact, excuse me, that it's possible to take, I think, five round trip times to actually find the, the, the MTU in the end. It's possible, yes. But you're relying on packet timeout. It's a really unreliable signal. And I think a very unsatisfactory one from a protocol design perspective. We got TCP path MTU discovery all wrong. And it's a shame. We really need to go back there and make it faster as well as more reliable. Bring him back. To oh, your fourth uh, point. <laughs> so I have a one I skipped over because we ended up there. So Apple is coming from zero second on happy eyeballs to 50. They are not coming from 300. So th that's why we're, they're proposing 50 uh, because they were doing zero in their first uh, happy eyeballs. They were just saying, race it off, whatever answers first. That's what the best what Apple were doing precisely, I, I find equally curious, and it wasn't zero. 
Um, if you actually have a look inside your Apple machine prior to the latest OSS, it actually kept a record of the round trip time for every destination you'd ever gone to in four and every destination you'd ever gone to in six. And so if you're going to somewhere you've been before in both four and six, Apple compared the two times and said, I'll take the fastest. Fair enough. What if you'd never been there before? Oh, says Apple, I have an answer. I will take the average round trip time of everything you've ever been to in four and the average round trip time of everything you've ever been to in six and I'll just pick the fastest. And you sort of go, why? Why does that make any sense at all that this unknown destination has a round trip time equal to the average of the rest? And the comparison makes sense. It's sort of, oh, it seemed good to us. It was a Friday afternoon, I suppose. We had to do something. So, you know, it was a very unsatisfactory answer even then. Moving to 50 millisecs, I think, actually, it's on the edge of the razor blade. It's a tough time. Right, but initially, it, I, I don't, I haven't heard any, I've talked to the Apple people multiple times, and I've never heard what you just said, but okay. Um, the, the 100 gig, four times 25, that's a gearbox. It, it shaves the packet down and shoves it down the four paths simultaneously. There is no equal cost multipath on those four times 25. What did 25. you just say? Yes. It sends the same packet down all four paths no, simultaneously? It, no, it, it's, oh, sorry, like it's an you. inverse MUX. It, it sends parts of the bits of the packet down well, the four paths. I think that, yeah, I've had these conversations with vendors as well. And the vendors that I've talked to around the Arista area, packet by packet each channel. Well, when I participated yeah. in the 100 gig standards development, it was an inverse gearbox. It was a bit, it, it was a bit it, 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 it cuts up the packets and sends them down, inverse MUX down these four channels. But if you have parallel 100 gig links using alt equal cost multipath, your, in serious uh, trouble. your point is valid. But in this specific case, it's not. Okay, I th I've now made my four You feel better. Out. Yes, he feels so better. I'll, I'll yield the floor to someone else. Anyone Thank else you. want to defend V6? Because it's really worth defending. <laughs> we have like one minute for one very final quick question, if anyone has one for Jeff. Why didn't we roll the key? Why didn't we roll the key? I think that's <laughs> going to take more than a minute. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>